Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm very excited because we have Stavros on our show, and he is a fitness and weight loss coach. And today, he's here to talk about how to lose weight and sustain healthy weight loss. And he has such great information that he wants to share with us, and I'm very excited to have him on the show. So Stavros, tell us a little about yourself and what you do. First of all, thank you for having me on your show. Uh I'm busy. I call myself a practical fitness coach because I think fitness has become too impractical and hard to live with. And I've been practicing. I got into the industry back in 1992. And I like, I'm probably one of the few fitness professionals who never loved fitness. I actually got into it because I realized that the average fitness profession doesn't understand me. And I think that people... I uh, needed somebody like me who wants to be in shape, but don't want to make my life all about fitness. Right. You know, so it's a all about, you know, how to get in shape without making your life miserable in the process, you know? Yes. You know, we were talking about it before and we were mentioning how society has changed so much and that we see a lot of obesity in our society and that it is glorified in our society. Like, you know, be, you know, being obese is beautiful. Being overweight is fine. And you see a you see a huge increase in overweight people. But, you know, you have to look mm -hmm. at that being overweight opens us up to different illnesses and conditions like, you know, uh, having heart problems, having high blood pressure, having high cholesterol, you know, strokes, heart attacks. There's so many things. Diabetes has tripled in the United States. You know, yeah. there is a lot of medical issues and a lot of it is related to how we eat. And, you know, we do have a society that we spend over a billion dollars in weight loss programs, advertising weight loss programs. There's so many things out there, but yet we do still have a society that is overweight. So, you know, what can we do? Why is it, first of all, why is it so important that we really sustain a healthy weight and what can we do? Like, because there's so many things out there. I'm sure people are confused on um, what yeah. to do, how to go about it. So maybe you could clear some of these things up because, you know, I don't think people know and understand a healthy way to, to lose weight. We're all different, but yet yeah. it doesn't seem like a lot of things are working. And, and, you know, we, like we mentioned earlier, a lot of times when people lose weight, they end up gaining it back. So, you know, and that's, a, it's not a small percentage. It's a large percentage. So something's not right. And, you know, what's your intake on all these things? Well, that's one of the first things I realized when I got into the industry, the fitness industry, that, that 95% of the people who lost weight gained it right back. So when I talk to other colleagues of mine, they will always say, well, people don't have the priorities straight or that they're lazy. But then when I came up across the number that 95% of the people gain the weight back, I'm like, 95% of the people cannot be something wrong with them. Yeah. So I started looking at the, at the methods that they use to lose the weight. And that's where I found the biggest problem is that these methods don't take into consideration human nature. I think they kind of left that out because you hear people say all the time, fitness professionals, that, wow, well, once people see results, you'll be motivated to keep going. Right. And I, I used to hear that all the time. The problem is the best results in the world will not keep anyone motivated if the results were achieved through a method that is overwhelming. And let's right. face it, most of the methods out there are way overwhelming. Yeah. And, and I think that is, that's where really the problem begins is that the methods of weight loss, although very effective, I don't question their effectiveness. Yeah. What I do question is there are for the ability of the people to adapt those habits into their life. Yes. Because, you know, at the end of the day, I'm sure you've heard the saying, you know, what's more important than your health, right? Right. Well, health, I agree, it's very important. But in it matters because without your health, nothing else, you know, matters. But right. what if what's the point of having your health if having your health made your life miserable? In other yeah. words, all the stuff that you have to do to be healthy and lean is making your life miserable. What is the point? Right. Because I think that most people want to be healthy and they want to have a lean body so they can have a better quality of life. Because yes. let's face it, you know, the healthier you are, your quality of life improves. Yes. You know, you fit in, you know, in better clothes. You don't have to worry about your health. You don't have to worry about so many things. But 
if your life becomes all about fitness and counting calories and points and spending 30, you know, three hours in the gym every day, I don't know. Yeah. And I find that the, you know, the current methods of weight loss is like you have a choice or be fit and miserable mm -hmm. or be unhealthy and happy, at least for a short period before you get the disease. <laughs> and I, I get I get into the industry to give people a third choice where they can be lean and healthy and uh, and enjoy life because I think to me it's important to have both yeah and and a lot of the um because uh, unfortunately what well, what gave me the idea that it's possible that yes you can be fit healthy and enjoy life because when I get, we came out of school, I got all my certifications, all the stuff that were teaching me to teach my clients to lose weight made life miserable. Like, you know, counting calories, counting points, measuring things. It creates a lot of uh, stress. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, when I lived in Greece, nobody worried about their health. Nobody worried about our diet. Nobody worried about exercising. Right. And yet most people were thin and healthy. I actually mm -hmm. thought as a kid that cancer was a rare disease. That's right. really because I didn't know anyone who had cancer or anyone who knew anyone who had cancer. Right. Uh, same thing with, you know, Parkinson's, all, uh, Alzheimer's, all those diseases, the mental diseases. Yeah. Those things didn't even exist on the island. Right. By the way, unfortunately, now they do because unfortunately, even in Greece, things have changed for, for the worse. Yeah. And so, so the question I asked was like, wait a minute, how come back then, Nobody worried about the diet, and yet we were thin and healthy. Right. It's because all the behaviors that kept us in shape were habitual behaviors mm -hmm. taught to us by our traditions. Our traditions actually, you know, taught this tradition, this behaviors to each generation. Yes. And that's how we stay in shape, mm -hmm. you know? And to me, that's why the bottom line is that whatever you do to lose weight, that those behaviors have to become habitual. That's really the bottom line. Right. You make them habitual, that means you engage in them without having to think. Yeah. And that's how you can they almost like put your weight loss program on autopilot. You know? Yeah. That's I think that's the best way to lose weight. Put it on autopilot, you don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> uh, you know, that's uh, and but unfortunately, if you look at the current methods of weight loss, all the behaviors through which they help people lose weight are behaviors that can never become habitual, which means you always have to think to do the right thing. Right. And as we all know, thinking is tiresome. Yeah, in the beginning, you, it's exciting. But yeah. if you have a life, you have a job, you have kids, you have to take care of all those things you got to do. And you have to think about, on top of it, your diet. Yeah. And I think that's why I think most people end up burning out. And the other issue with uh, thinking, having to, to think to do the right thing, is that think about it. If something requires thinking in order to engage in it, that means it requires motivation. Right. Right. You have to be motivated to take the action. Well, yeah. most people, when they gain weight, the extra weight is what motivates them to take action. Right. right. Well, once you've lost the weight, well, you also lost the motivation to take action. Yes. And then you revert back to your old habits. Mm -hmm. That is why, to me, it's essential that whatever behaviors you engage in to lose the weight, by the time you lost the weight, those behaviors have to become second nature, habitual. Because if yes. they're not, you lost your motivation now, you're going to gain the weight back. Does it does it make sense? That makes 100% sense, yes. Because I feel like if, it, you know, if we, if we have to think about it consistently, it is tiresome. And then actually... It, it, it after a while you 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 get tired of doing it like when you if you if you have to weigh the food or count the points and, and yep. you know every little thing you have to put in your mouth you have to take count for after a while it, it gets a little stressful you know you, you and you lose the motivation to want to continuously do it because it's too much work there's so many things going on you just want to be able to enjoy yourself you do want to lose weight but you don't want yeah. to have to go through this whole big thing you know and it's very hard to incorporate that in your life and make it so natural because it seems like after a while people get tired of doing it and then they go back to their old ways from what i see yes exactly they go back you go you always revert back to your old habits because 
it's again having I don't, I don't really think we were put on this earth to be watching a diet yeah i don't think anybody was put in there or, or to spend <laughs> half of my time in the gym working out like yeah I, we're put on this earth to enjoy ourselves exactly and i think back in the old days our health was taken care of automatically yeah by our daily life yes and you know and i think due to modern conveniences we moved away from the traditional habits that kept us in shape right. and what i did early in my career was i started uh, looking at my upbringing mm -hmm. and i tell you i mean a quick story about that because I went to school like everybody else. I took nutrition. I got certified by the top certification companies. And initially, when I first got into the industry, I was teaching uh, the same stuff as everybody else. Right. And guess what? My clients were also getting the same results as everybody else. In other words, they were losing the weight and then gaining it back. Losing the weight, gaining it back. And it was very frustrating. Yeah. And then one day, I was talking to my mother. And we're talking about breakfast. And my mother mentions to me, like, well, because how come you telling your clients that breakfast is the most important meal of the day? And I said to her, well, that's where I learned in school. And I gave her all the studies. Mm -hmm. And the only question she asked me was, well, did you eat breakfast when we lived in Greece? Mm -hmm. And that was my aha moment. And I started, I'm thinking, wait a minute, we never ate breakfast. Right. And again, when I lived in Greece, thin was the norm. Mm -hmm. Cancer was a rare disease. Yeah. And people in their 90s and 100s lived independent, fully functional. Yeah. So then when I start taking a closer look at the breakfast studies that I was taught in school, come to find out they were not very good studies. They were basically observational studies. Yeah. So that was the beginning of how I started changing how everything that I taught and everything I thought that I knew about fitness because it was contradicting my upbringing. And when right. I started looking at all the healthy regions around the world, I realized that they completely contradict what we are taught in this country and how to lose weight and, and get in shape. Yeah. And that's how I started uncovering different behaviors. Uh, for example, I think we talked about that earlier, that, uh, you know, when when I ask somebody, what is proper nutrition? Most people will tell me about the food you should be eating and the food you should be avoiding. Right. Well, there's two parts of proper nutrition. Part one is what you're eating, which I agree. Right. Part two, how and why you eat. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, when I was in school, the whole debate was, What's the best thing to eat for breakfast? What's the best thing to eat for lunch? And what's the best thing to eat for dinner? Right. Nobody debated, why should I be eating lunch? Why am I eating breakfast? Why am I eating dinner? Right. And to me, the only reason you should be eating is if you're hungry. Yes. But when was the last time, you know, the, the audience, you know, you stop and think before you eat. Am I hungry? Or am I eating because somebody told me I got to eat lunch or I got to eat breakfast or I got to eat dinner? Right. And, and, and to me... Like I give you an example, like for hunger, uh, in Greece, there was no lunch period for school. You went to school, there was like a 50 minute break between classes and my mother would give us money and there was a place sold snacks. So if I want to eat something, I would buy a snack. Right. Now, as a kid, if I hadn't eaten by 12 o'clock noon, even if I was hungry past 12, I would not dare eat because at, 12 uh, at two o'clock I had to be home to eat lunch. Right. And my mother told us, you better be hungry when you get home for lunch. And it was drilling to our heads. Yeah. You know? Mm hmm And nothing wrong with being hungry. Hunger is a good thing. Right. You know, I'm not talking about starving. You're talking about, you know, let your yeah. body go hungry. And that's when I started realizing, wait a minute. We need to learn to eat out of true hunger. We need to, we need a break from food. Right. You know, that just like exercising, I tell people, yes. Eating the right diet, absolutely essential, good, because you need the right nutrient, the right, uh, the the right substance for the body to grow. Yeah. But the body also needs a break from food to detox, to get rid of toxins that accumulates over time. Yeah. Also to get rid of. Uh, are you familiar with the term autophagy? Autophagy, no. Mm -mm. It's oh, by the way, it's a Greek word. It means to eat yourself, <laughs> and it it, it it's. Because eating yourself, in other words, uh, the guy who discovered it, uh, sorry, he didn't discover it. He discovered the process. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was he won a, he won the Nobel Prize in 2016. Was a Japanese doctor, and during autophagy, which happens when you take a break from food, mm -hmm. the, number one, the body detoxifies much faster, so you get rid of all the toxins you accumulated. Right. It also gets rid of mutated and dysfunctional cells, which are the precursors to a lot of the cancers. 
Yes. Also, it gets rid of uh, misfold the proteins, which mm-hmm. is the precursor to all the brain diseases. Right. So it's like, that's that's why we need a break from food. We need it. And the next one is learn to eat slowly and mindfully and stop eating when you satisfy your hunger. Yes. Like, you know, when we, you know, the, the food on the plate, whoever served us, do they really know how much we need to eat? Right. So if you learn to eat slowly and mindful, well, guess what? You can, uh, the brain's going to get the message that you're full and you have a better chance of stop eating at a much yes. faster rate without having to count anything. Yes. And that's where I started realizing those behaviors were part of our lives. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, and that's where I started teaching my clients. And guess what? All of a sudden, the, the results improved dramatically. And we haven't even talked about what to eat yet. Yeah. We only, I only covered up how to eat. Right. And the, and I think I mentioned earlier the the uh, supersize me. I'm sure probably your your audience know about the documentary Supersize Me, where they Mr. Spurlock he went to McDonald's and he ate McDonald's for one month and he gained 26 pounds, I believe, and he got really sick, so he had to stop. Yeah. So in 2011, I did the same experiment. I went for two months to McDonald's, same food, great food, and <laughs> but I followed my three how to eat habits. I call them now how and why to eat habits. So I ate only out of true hunger. Mm -hmm. I took regular breaks from food and I ate my food slowly and mindfully. And as soon as I felt satisfied, I stopped eating. Right. I went to the doctor. I had my blood work done before and after blood pressure, everything. Mm -hmm. So guess what happened to me after two months of eating McDonald's? What happened? Nothing. My cholesterol actually dropped 10 pounds. You know, Uh dropped my cholesterol on McDonald's diet. Oh, My weight went down three pounds, which is insignificant. Yeah. But the... You know, and again, I, I want the audience to get the wrong idea here. McDonald's food is not good food. The <laughs> point I'm trying to prove is if you listen to your body, your body can better tolerate food and might not be as good for you. Yes. And that was the whole point. Mm-hmm. And and that's how, and that's, and that's what my first three habits I established. Then my next habit that I started teaching was, my favorite one, by the way, is make junk food special. Right. Because let's face it. Junk food, if it was that easy to get rid of, all the junk food companies would be out of business by now. Mm-hmm. Because we all know junk food is bad for you. Yes. So what I did was, I said, okay, we need to make them special. Like when I lived in Greece, do we eat junk food? Absolutely. But it was on the weekends, special occasions. It wasn't an everyday event. Right. I remember as a kid, my mother on the weekends would get us potato chip and Coke. It was such a big deal Like we got potato chip and Coke. Nowadays, nobody even gets excited for potato chip and Coke because it's something you have every day. Right. And, and to me, it's like, again, by eating junk food not so often, the body can better tolerate them. Yes. And especially if you, you know, if you take breaks from food regularly, the body can get rid of the toxins that accumulate due to the terrible food that you were eating. Yes. So th- that's a balance. And besides, uh, it's in human nature to want what we can have. So if I tell you, I don't know, but what's your favorite junk food that you like, that you enjoy, right. you know? Yeah. So let's say chocolate for most people. If okay. I tell you, you know something, no more chocolate for you. <laughs> what is the chance of that happening? Right. You know, slim to none. Sooner or later, you're going to give in and you're not going to just have one piece of chocolate. You can have two, three bars with the chocolate. Right. And that was, by the way, my first experience uh, myself that I remember I used to be a huge junk food eater. Mm-hmm. So my wife one day, she goes, you know, don't you feel a little bit hypocritical? <laughs> you gain weight. I see you you telling your clients to stop eating junk food. And yet yourself, you done some junk food. Mm-hmm. And it was years ago. And yeah. I say, no, that's that's a good point. So I said, you know, I'm going to give up junk food. And uh, so this way I can better understand my clients who have to give up things. Right. So the first time I did was I get rid of all junk food from my house. But then I would go to my mother's house. And my mother would keep all my favorite junk food there, like devil dogs and all that stuff. Yeah. I would go to my mother's house and have half a box of devil dogs. And made me realize this is not working because this made me want it even more. Yeah. And that's how I came up with the idea of make junk food special. Right. So my rule was Monday to Friday, no junk food. Friday after 5 p.m. and the week, I can have all I want. And guess what happened? Because I could have it every weekend, Number one, was easy for me to control myself during the week. Because if, let's say, I had a craving for Coke on Thursday, 
I knew that all I had to do was wait till Friday night and I can have the Coke guilt free. Right. And I always tell people, junk food tastes much better when there's no guilt that follows it. Right. So it's easy for me to resist. Now, the first weekend that I did that, I really had tons of Coke. The third, the second weekend, I had some. The third weekend, I forgot. Actually, because during the week, I wouldn't have junk food. All of a sudden, on the third week, I went to the whole weekend. It was Monday. And I'm like, wait a minute. I didn't have my normal junk food anymore. <laughs> and now I have junk food every so often, but it's not something I crave as much anymore. Yeah. And that's, and that's my, and my, the lesson that I learned is when you say no to something, it backfires. You mm-hmm. got to give yourself permission to have it once in a while. Right. And you'll find that just because you can have it, it's easier to resist during the time you don't need to have it. And eventually yeah. you break that, that hole that it has on you. Right. That makes sense. You know, I, I think when I, when I detox myself from sugar, it was like getting off a of heroin. But once I detoxed myself from sugar and I wasn't, I wasn't going towards, you know, I took sugar out of my coffee. I, 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 you know, if I, if it wasn't, if I, I didn't use any extra sugars and I was watching what I was eating, trying to eat much cleaner and I lost the craving for sugar. And when I would eat something that had sugar, if I did treat myself, I was in a restaurant and maybe I had a piece of cake and I had a bite or two, it was too sweet for me. I did. I started liking the taste. Yeah. How long did it take you to get used to not having sugar? It was hard. It, it took me, it took me a, a couple of weeks to get off of it. It was like weaning myself off of it. Yeah. And, but once I, I weaned myself off of it, I quickly got used to not having the sugar. You know, it was, it was hard getting off of it. But once I got off of it, I kind of lost the, the craving. Once it was out of my body for yeah. a while, I just totally lost the craving. And, you know, even mentally, I, I didn't really want any more sugar foods because when I was tasting food that had a taste of sugar in it, I wasn't liking the taste anymore. It was too sweet for me all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah. I had actually the same experience I had with, with coffee. I used to have three teaspoons of sugar in my coffee and I slowly went down to two, down to, to one. Now I'm down to zero. Mm-hmm. And now if I put a teaspoon of sugar in my coffee, I find it too sweet. Yeah. You know? And then, you know, like the Greek desserts, uh, which I, I bake all like baklava and the yeah. burrito. In the past, I could eat like four or five pieces, no problem. Yeah. Now I have one. I'm good. The second one almost makes me sick. Like it was almost like a too much sugar. Me too. So now, too. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that's, but the, the hardest part I think is for, is to get through the first couple of weeks to, to get through it. But yeah. once you're on the other side, I think you're going to feel so good. And again, to me, though, I always believe that give yourself permission to have those things, but you'll find that you're not going to want them as much anymore or you'll yeah. be satisfied. Like I know now I can have one piece of baklava, you know, once in a blue moon when I make it. Right. I'm satisfied. I yes. no longer have that craving to have four and five. Right. And, you know, and to me, the other part that I think that the industry, again, means well, but I think that they're burning people out is which I call it, you know, the fourth fundamental healthy habit is the exercise part. Yeah. Now, obviously we all know we need to exercise. Okay. Mm -hmm. The problem I find is that most trainers are pushing people like they're going to join the next Olympics or something. (laughs) They're taking, you know, training out of sports and they're trying to apply it to everyday person who just wants to be in shape. Right. And I think that's where a lot of people, never mind they get injured too, they burn out. Yeah. My philosophy is that, uh, number one, the first goal of an exercise program is to develop the habit of exercising. Right. How do we do that? Simple. I'll tell you actually another funny story that actually changed my whole approach to fitness. Uh, my dentist is also my client here. Mm-hmm. So I will go to my dentist for my regular cleanup. And he, uh, he would tell me how I'm not flossing enough. So he would give me all the reasons why I should floss. And I would go inspired. I would go home. I'll floss for a couple of weeks and then fall off the wagon. And then continue <laughs> for years, by the way. And it was the same story. And then when uh, we're talking about habits, that's when I realized, like, wait a minute. I said, the I'm asking my clients to break habits all the time or to develop new habits. Well, let me put myself to the test and see if I can develop the habit of flossing. Right. And, and that's why I started doing a lot of research of how to develop the habits 
And I came across the, uh, the method, I don't know if you heard of it, the Kaizen method. It's an ancient Asian philosophical system on how to apply change. Okay. The whole system basically is take an action, break it into the smallest action possible, mm -hmm. and then focus on applying the little action. By the way, forget the results that you want. Right. The first goal is to develop a habit. So what I did was I took flossing. I said, what is the smallest action I can take? Floss one tooth. So mm -hmm. I started flossing one tooth. Now, when I told my dentist what I was doing, his reaction was, you're not flossing, you're wasting your time. Mm -hmm. I said, George, I'm not trying to floss. I'm trying to develop the habit of picking up the string every night. Step number <laughs> one. And I relax about the rest of the teeth. I relax about the result that I wanted. I said, right. let me develop the habit. Yes. And because there was only one tooth, very easy to do. It would be times I'd be laying in bed. I'm like, oh, I forgot to floss. I would get up, do one tooth. Of course, my wife always laughed at me. But <laughs> I kept consistently doing it. And it took me maybe a month and a half, two months. And I found myself flossing every single tooth. And now I've been flossing ever since. It's been what, 20 years since I developed the habit. Mm -hmm. And now it's part of my life. And that's right. when I start applying the same philosophy on exercising. So I'll give you an example. We all know we need to walk regularly, right? Right. Now, if you ask the uh, most fitness trainers, we'll tell you you need to walk at least 20 minutes, three times a week. Right. Great advice. But the problem is, if somebody doesn't walk at all, 20 minutes, what is the chance of them doing, going from zero to 20 minutes? Yeah. Not very good. They might do it for a time or two, but let's say one day you you had a long day at work, you're tired, you get home, you look at the treadmill, like, ah, forget, it, I'll do it tomorrow. And tomorrow yeah. never comes. Exactly. The advice I give my clients is that all I want you to do is three times a week or one to five minutes. That's mm -hmm. it. You do one minute, I'm happy. Of course, the question I ask, well, what would one minute do? It's not going to do anything. But what it will do is get you on the treadmill or get you to walk. Yeah. So the first... You know, the first goal is to get you into the behavior of walking. Forget the 20 minutes. Right. Once you get into it, then stop pushing it to longer and longer and longer. Right. And that, to me, has worked like magic. All of a sudden, it was so much easier for my clients to develop the walking habit. Right. And then the same thing with all the eating habits is it's, we focus on developing one healthy eating behavior at a time. And slowly, as we develop the basics, we get into more and more habits. I mean, obviously, as you know, there's tons of different healthy habits we all can develop. I mean, even myself, mm -hmm. I'm still developing new healthy habits. Like uh, five years ago, I got into cold showers right, uh, and, and cold plunges. Mm -hmm. uh, I started doing breath work. Uh, I'm, I'm doing meditation. It's other stuff that even myself, the, the journey never ends. Yes. But I'm enjoying the journey. Right. You know, like I'm, I'm sure yourself, you know, you've been in it for a long time, but there's always something more I can improve. Yeah. But I don't, you know what I mean? I, I'm always looking, but I'm not desperate. In other words, I'm very healthy now. But I'm like, you know, what else can I do? Right. Uh, but I find the good news is that I would say 99.9% .9 of my clients lose the way that they want within the first three eating habits with what we've been getting to anything else. And that's the good news that you can lose weight. But as we both know, it's not just about weight loss, it's about also health. Yes. And it's, you know, you know, but to me, I, as a matter of fact, I looked at weight loss as a side effect of taking care of your health. Right. You know? It's true. And, and talking about that too, I always another thing that I always tell my client when they first jo when they first come in, and I tell them that you know something, just so you know, nobody has a weight problem. Mm -hmm. And usually the look at me is like, "What do you mean? I have a weight problem. Look at me. I need to lose at least twenty or thirty or forty pounds." I'm like, "No, no, no. You don't have a weight problem. What you have is a behavior problem. The weight is only the side effect right. of your behaviors." Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you want to lose weight. You got to engage in certain behaviors. Right. So it, that's what we need to focus on. And that's to me is the key to success, to sustainable success. Yeah. Is figuring out what unhealthy behaviors. I think we both know that if you're overweight and unhealthy, that means that you engage in behaviors that are not good for your body. That's all it yeah. means. Mm -hmm. So we, I think we need to go back, look at your healthy behavior, look at your behaviors. 
identify which ones are healthy, which ones are unhealthy. Right. Identify which um, which healthy behaviors are missing from your life. Yes. And then get to work on one at a time. Mm -hmm. Apply a new healthy behavior to your life and replace an unhealthy one. Until right. they get becomes a habit, go to the next one. And and I find that system has worked wonders. And that's the, the approach that I recommend people to take is one habit at a time. Right. I think that's so true. I think, you know, that's the biggest thing is for people to break unhealthy habits. But if you little by little start incorporating good habits and then you start incorporating those good habits into your life, you'll see that you're starting to do less of those bad things because you're starting to get yes. a new way of life. You're developing a healthy lifestyle. And when you see the positive outcomes that are occurring from this, this healthy lifestyle, you're going to automatically see yourself starting to diminish those unhealthy behaviors and not by force, just by naturally not needing it because now you've compensated those bad habits with these good habits and you're getting positive results, which is something that will give you the motivation to keep going. I agree. And I think you said it perfectly changing them without forcing it. You know, it's almost like a natural process instead of having to use your will to, to change. And I, I think I'm glad you mentioned it. I think it's very important for people to realize that it will happen naturally. Yeah. And I think it, it, to me, a job, my job as, as a coach is really the most important part is that you, know, you heard the saying, knowledge is power. Okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't completely agree with that because knowledge by itself is not going to make any difference in your life. Applied yeah. knowledge it will makes a difference. Yes. And sometimes the hardest part to change is making a different decision that you normally make. Right. By the way, I didn't say that. Joe Dispenza said that. I want to give you that credit. <laughs> and when I heard him, I'm like, that is so true that the hardest part of change is making a different decision that you normally make. And yeah. to me, a good coach, that's what this coach job is, to help you keep making that different decision. Right. And eventually, once you make the new decision enough times, it starts becoming habitual, and all of a sudden, it becomes the default decision. Right. And I think, you know, my job as a coach is to help people not just teach them what healthy behaviors need to incorporate into their life, but help them stick with each new behavior long enough right. until it becomes automatic. Exactly. And once that happens, you, you're home free. Yeah. And, and, you know, mm -hmm. and I think the, the, uh, those are the, like the, I think the habits, the how to eat habits and the exercise, because to me, exercising far in a way, by the way, I exercise myself because right. again, Never liked exercising, but I've been exercising for the past 20 years, but it's a habit. And I was like brushing my teeth. Right. But what I did was my, I don't have a workout. My workout, the longest time I spend exercising, like probably five minutes. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I, I squeeze it throughout my day. In other words, I have a little break between clients. I do some push-ups. Right. I have another break. I do some squats. I have another break. I do some jumps. It kind of, I squeeze it in, in during time. That's really downtime. And normally I'll be looking at my cell phone wasting time on social media. Right. With nothing wrong with that once in a while to relax your mind. But how much time do we really waste? Yeah. In our everyday. Tons of time. Doesn't matter how busy we are, we all waste. Well, I took that time I was wasting and I made my workout out of it. And also my work on this is the my recommendation to my clients is my workout has two types of exercises. The must do's. Yeah. And the optional ones. Mm -hmm. The must do's by the way, there's only three. And it takes me less than five minutes to do. The optional ones is the rest of the workout. Right. By doing that, I found that the days that I didn't feel like working out, now, by the way, it's such a habit. I don't, it doesn't even, doesn't even phase me. But in the right. beginning, when I was trying to develop the habit, there were days I basically didn't want to work out. Right. Well, because there were only three exercises that took me less than five minutes to do. Well, I needed the most motivation. Yeah. In the beginning, when I used to fail to stick with my workouts, I had this perfect workout that took 45 minutes to complete. And there were days I didn't feel like working out. I skipped the whole thing. Right. And I found by having the must-do exercises and the optional ones, and by the way, most of the time I would do all of them anyway, because I you know what is the hardest part of the workout? Right. To start. Yes, exactly. I, You know what I mean? Yeah. And I found it much easier to adapt exercise into my life 
And because I fit it, and that's what I do with my clients, I fit it throughout the day in dead times. Mm -hmm. And honestly, you can get a great workout without needing any equipment or even go to the gym. Yeah. You know, yes. Could you get a better workout going to the gym? Absolutely. I'm not going to disagree with it. Yeah. Uh, which workout is the best? The one you will do. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, like the whole debate on uh, which is the best aerobic machine. Have you seen that? I see that all the time on the internet. And then yeah. I tell my clients because they ask me that. The best aerobic machine is the one you will do. <laughs> it doesn't matter which one is better. Right. If let's say you enjoy treadmill and you hate the bike or vice versa. Right. If let's say the, the, the science saying bike is better than treadmill, it's irrelevant to you. Exactly. What's relevant is which one you would do. Yeah. And I think you know, sometimes a lot of the experts, which they mean well, they focus so much on which workout, like in other words, I look at trainers. They focus on developing the best workout that would get my clients the best results. Yeah. And they forgot that if the client doesn't like the workout. Yeah, exactly. You're not going to get any results. Yeah. And that's, and to me, my whole philosophy is like, first, let's get into working out. Let's right. develop the habit. Once yeah. we get to develop the habit, then, and you're really liking it, then, okay, let's start replacing some of the stuff that you do right. with something more effective. Exactly. And slowly make the workout better. Yes. You know? I agree. You know, I think uh, with the exercise, if you keep <clears throat> increasing it with little things, if you start little, and then as you go along, you build inner strength, and then you have the motivation, you'll automatically start doing it more and more and more, and you'll feel better. You'll you'll get that internal strength. <clears throat> Excuse me. No problem to um, be able to do it because in the beginning when you don't really exercise that much it gets very difficult to exercise in the yes. beginning so but as you go along you build strength and then you're able to do more and more and more you know and and you should be you know it shouldn't have to be a chore it should be something you enjoy to do and you should be doing exercises and different and different types of exercises that you enjoy that will be helpful to the to to your body you know, I think, you know, putting yourself through agony is only going to make you backfire and go and you're going to end up, you know, like we mentioned in the earlier conversation, you're going to end up relapsing and, and gaining that weight back, which you don't want to do. I, I agree. Because the one thing I always tell my clients is that you always want to finish the workout at the point that you still want to do more. You want to yes. finish the workout thinking I could have done more. And and I, I tell my clients here, like, and then I'll be kicking you out. I want you to when you leave with the feeling it could have done more, well, guess what? You look forward to the next workout. Yes. Instead of you push yourself so hard that by the time the workout is over, you're like, thank God this is over. Well, <laughs> you begin to dread the process. Yes. And, but again, I think it's unfortunately, a lot of the advice and exercising has come out of uh, sports specific training, which is a very different type of training. Yes, I mean, it is. I, you know what I mean? Like I give you an interesting statistic. Did you know that 90% of the benefits from weight training come from the first set? 90%. Second set, you get another maybe 9%. And the third set, you really hardly get even 1%. Now, really? for the average Joe, yes, the difference is really big difference. I, see, I didn't and know that. For the, yeah. So to me, it's like, why are we killing ourselves doing three sets? Oh, because that's what the, the sports-specific training does. Well, yes, for athletes, 1% might be the difference between a gold medal or nothing. <laughs> so that's a different, no, but for the average person, 1%, it makes no difference. Right. But you're going to spend half of your workout, basically half of the time working out to get maybe 5% benefit. Right. Is it really worth it? You know what I mean? In the beginning? No, because that extra 30 minutes of working out might burn you out. Now, yeah. later on, by the way, if you really get into it, by all means, you right. know, that, that's fine. But my, I know myself, Ever since I learned that, and by the way, this information is you know, all the certification programs. This is not some obscure information. Right. And yet, though, I don't know, train, we, we so accustomed to the three sets that I have to actually alarm my client when they come in, uh, they all you know gun hole when I work out. And when I explain about the one set, a lot of times I have to show them the research because they don't believe me because it was yeah. so, you know, uh, we will hear all the time, you got to do three sets, three sets, three sets, three sets. <laughs> and I'm like, no. Because by the way, the, one of the questions I asked for my, because again, I never liked exercising was, 
<laughs> what is the minimum I can do to get the maximum benefits out of it? Right. And that's the approach I took into fitness. And that's how, you know, I've been in the business for over 30 years, now 32 years. Mm -hmm. And that's how I end up to the program I have now, which hardly takes any time. The diet actually takes no time because all those behaviors, by the way, one of the benefits is that they become habitual. Right. So in other words, now I can go to, I could go to a breakfast meeting mm -hmm. and they can be offered breakfast and I won't eat it. It doesn't even phase me. It doesn't even create the cravings or a lot of times uh, my clients, if they bake something, because I do a lot of baking, they'll yeah. bring it into my office to, for me to try. Uh, during the day, I don't eat normally. I will sit on my desk and I take it home and eat it later. I no, I don't get the cravings. Right. And and I think the the uh, the third uh, well, I think the three main issues that I find with uh, weight loss programs, and I want to talk about the third one in a second, is that the first one is that the behaviors through which they help people lose weight cannot become habitual, which means you have to rely on the conscious mind to do the work. Right. The second one is that they expect people to change all their habits overnight and in order to lose weight fast. Because again, in order to lose weight fast, you got to make big changes in your life. Yeah. Well, big changes lead to burnout. Right. And the and the question I have is, did we all learn? I'm sure you learned the the the, the hair and the tourist story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like, you know, the point of the story, right? It's like that slow and steady wins the race. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to go slow and steady nowadays. Everybody wants results by tomorrow. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the actually one really good book to me, this book really helped me better understand the subconscious mind. Have you heard the book uh, Biology of Belief by Bruce Lipton? I, I know the book, but I don't I don't remember the synopsis of it. Yeah. It, it, to me, it changed my whole life. And it, it basically explained how 95% of our day is run by a subconscious mind, basically habitual behaviors. Mm. Consciously, we only really control 5% of our day. Wow. And the reason for that, and the thing is, once the audience understands this, they see why I keep pushing that we need to create whatever behaviors we engage in to lose weight they have to become habitual. Yeah. And here's why. The Our conscious mind can process something like 40 bits of environmental stimuli per second. So yeah. basically, we can only think of one thing at a time or can do one thing at a time. The subconscious mind, on the other hand, can process 40 million bits of environmental stimuli per second. Basically, right. it can do thousands of things at once. Now, our mind is really smart. So what it, what it does in order to free up our conscious mind to focus on life, it mm -hmm. took repetitive tasks and gave them to the subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. This way, our conscious mind can be free to enjoy life. Right. And that is why in healthy regions, we can enjoy life. We don't have to think about our diet, about all that stuff, because all those things we're taking care of automatically by our subconscious mind. Yes. And if you look at the diet industry here, they, they are uh, they're using the conscious mind to control the behaviors. And right. I think that was the big mistake because it, it tires people out. And and the thing is, you cannot change overnight. Yes. Again, I, the, in the analogy I use for people who have degrees, let's say you're a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Imagine taking all, read all the books and you need to read in order to become a lawyer all in one semester. <laughs> Impossible. Well, how do you expect to change all your bad habits or develop all the good habits overnight? Exactly. You know, we got to do it in steps. And I think the third issue that I, I think is big issue is that a lot of the programs don't change the biggest obstacle, which is ourselves, our right. subconscious beliefs yes. about ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because you hear Very people true. say, you, I don't know, you tell them, oh, you got to, oh, I can't do this. Or I hear people say, oh, I cannot, I have to have breakfast. Yeah. Well, if that's what you believe, you know, that's, that's true for you. Right. And, and that's, I think, a, a part of my coaching. I think that uh, I, I, ever since I implemented it made a big difference is so before anybody even works with me, with me right. I, I, what I called developing a healthy mindset, mm -hmm. I help them change the way they think. Cause I realized and reading the book, biology belief is what opened my mind yeah. about the subconscious beliefs that people have that, sabotage the progress right and the 
because I'm always learning from my clients too. Yeah. And this client, again, I have to be, I'm very thankful for, is this lady used to come to me four times a week. Mm -hmm. That was years ago, before I knew anything about psychology. Right. And she would exercise four times a week in, with me. So I knew for sure he was exercising. Yeah. It, it supposedly working on all her eating habits and could not lose a freaking ounce. Nothing. <laughs> And she was getting very frustrated. I was getting frust frustrated because I'm like, you go, are you sure you're doing everything I'm telling you? Oh, absolutely, I'm doing everything. Mm -hmm. I follow your program precisely. So one day, we we're having a loud conversation because she was getting very frustrated. Yeah, yeah. Her husband was also a client of mine. So her husband was his appointment right after hers. So he comes in, he overheard a conversation, doesn't say anything. She leaves. She goes to me, I'm going to tell you why my wife is not losing weight. As a matter of fact, Thank God he's coming to you because you would have gained a lot of weight. But you can't say anything that I told you. So you want to stay out of it. She goes, my wife, I would say two times a week or more after dinner, she will go out and have Chinese. <laughs> so she was, she, although she was following my habits perfect, because she picks a lot more often than she's saying. Right. Because I cannot say anything. So then when she came in next time, I, I, of course, I couldn't say anything. I try to get her to at least admit it. And she comes to me. She says to me, yeah, once in a blue moon, I might have like Chinese or I snack once in a blue moon, but it doesn't happen too often. The point was that the picking was so subconscious that she doesn't even realize. And that's the point I'm trying to get to. It's like, you'd be surprised if you truly don't believe that you can lose weight. The subconscious mind can do so many things you didn't even realize that he's doing to yeah. sabotage progress. Right. By giving you cravings, give you to to reach for food automatically. And right. that I think is the key to sustainable weight loss is not just change your habits, but change your mindset and yes. start seeing yourself differently. Like yeah. see yourself as a thin person, as a healthy person, instead of uh, an overweight person who's trying to lose weight. Yes. I think that's one of the biggest problems of a lot of people. I, I've talked to a lot of people, including myself sometimes, well, a lot of times, I'll be good for the whole day. And then I find myself when I'm in bed late at night, I start to pick a little bit because I'm in yeah. bed, I'm relaxing. And then I notice I'm great for the whole day. And then the worst time you could possibly eat is at nighttime. And I find myself, you know, picking a little bit on this or this. And then you wonder why you don't, you're not dropping the weight like you're supposed to, but it's become like we talked about a habit. You're relaxed, yeah. you're in bed. And then it's like your brain's automatically saying, well, you need a snack because this is what you do all the time, you know? Exactly. Yep. You know, that, and you see all the commercials, you know, you later at night, you're watching TV and the commercial pops out for some, you know, snack. Yeah. And, and you feel like, oh, I got the snacks. I'm going to go get one. <laughs> and to me, that was the hardest thing. By the way, to me, that was the hardest thing to break also is not snacking after dinner. Yeah. Now what I do is I have dinner and then I have a fruit and I'm done. Right. And that was a, I was a, the hardest habit to break. But now that I broke it, it it's like a second nature. But right. talk about snacks, actually. It, tell you another funny story. Like nowadays, you know, if the, let's say the school or the church has an event, a three hour event for the kids, right? Yeah. The parents run to get snacks for the kids. Oh, it's a three-hour event. We got a snack. Why? Are they going to drop dead from hunger if they don't eat for three hours? <laughs> like in Greece, you know, like in Greece, uh, there were uh, once a month, we would take a day trip yeah. you know, with the school. Mm -hmm. This was we took about eight hours. Right. And guess what? Nobody brought snacks with them. And we, uh, we stayed alive. <laughs> and this idea of snacking and again, is the food industry behind it trying to push the product? Which yes. I don't blame. I mean, yes, they want to make money. But to me, we need to realize that we need to be, we don't need to be eating every three or four or five hours. Right. And if the kids go hungry for four hours, nothing in the world. Exactly. Like, you know, and a lot of times I think people act as hunger is an emergency. And they I do. tell people, change the, you know what I mean? You mm -hmm. got to change the way you view hunger. And the way I view hunger and the way I tell my clients to view hunger is look at it. Let's say uh, it's three o'clock. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're hungry, truly hungry. Right. But you know you're going to be eating dinner at five. So in two yeah. hours, you'll be eating. Look at hunger that you're giving your body an opportunity to utilize the store energy that you have. Right. If you change 
from, oh my God, it's so uncomfortable to, oh, I'm giving my body an opportunity to, to uh, get rid of the store energy that I have, my fat basically. Right. All of a sudden you see it differently. Yeah. And I think if you do that enough times, you'll find that you're going to learn to control yourself. And I think is once you learn to control all, all these uh, automatic reactions, yes. weight loss becomes much easier, you know? Yes. And I think a lot and, of times too, we don't realize that a lot of these foods have ingredients that makes your, your body want to crave and, and want more of it too. Absolutely. I, I think this, well, <laughs> they want you to eat more. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, because I look at ingredients like junk food. Uh, if you look at a Greek chocolate, and I did that recently, actually, you look at a Greek chocolate and there's like five ingredients in there. And by the way, I can pronounce every single one. Hmm. You look at the, an American chocolate and it has like double or triple the ingredients and yeah. half of them, I didn't even know what they are. So why do we have to put all this extra stuff in there? Mm. Oh, so they can stay on the shelf for an extra, you know, half a year. Yeah. Usually, you know, all the preservatives. Right. And I think, so even the junk food that we have in Greece used to be much better quality junk food. Yeah. And I think the only way we're going to change the industry is if ourselves, we start demanding better food and by yes. buying more quality food. I mean, look at, look at uh, organic. In the beginning, mm -hmm. organic was... You could not find as easily. No. Now you can find it easier. Yes. Because I think that now the demand has gotten up, the industry will respond. So right. the point I want to make is change will never gonna come from the top down. Because no. food companies, all they care about, and again, I don't mean in a mean way, they want to make money. Yes. That's their job. They sell food. Mm -hmm. They're gonna sell, or they're gonna produce food that sells. Right. So it's up to us to change what we demand, what we're going for. And you see the industry will change along with us. It's not gonna, the industry is not going to come and dictate what you're going to eat. Besides, mm -hmm. I think it's going to annoy a lot of people. <laughs> you know, imagine the industry coming down and tell you, uh, this is what you need to eat. You shouldn't be eating this. You should be eating this. Yes. Uh, I'll tell you uh, a funny story about that. You know how restaurants getting blamed for the big portions? Yes. You know? Mm -hmm. You say, you know, all these big portions, that's why people are getting overweight. Yes. Obviously, you know, having Greek background, you know, a lot of my family owns restaurants and I used to work in restaurants too. Mm -hmm. The reason, I know my uncles, they, they own the diner. The reason they increase the size of the French fries, for example, is not that they decided one day, oh, I might give people more French fries. No, people demanded more French fries. Oh, really? So, Yes, it's the people that start complaining, hey, your portions are too small. So what, what my uncles are supposed to do? Oh, we're doing you a favor by giving you less fries because, you know, you're kind of overweight, so you got to eat less. <laughs> so he, uh, with the, uh, I did a document, the documentary that I did on, on uh, Super Size Me, uh, the Nagata College did it. Mm -hmm. We did actually a little funny videos on the side. So one of the videos was, so we had two people sitting at a restaurant ordering to eat so the waiter comes over so now one guy is overweight one is thin so the thin person says i'd like to have a turkey club with french fries and uh one extra gravy everywhere and a, a coke so then it goes to the next guy who is overweight what would you like to have sir he goes oh that sounds really good i'm gonna have the same thing uh sir i cannot serve you that because why not well the french fries are fattening and all the extra gravy is fattening and matter of fact you shouldn't be having soda because are you kidding me? Well, we don't want to be responsible for you getting more overweight than you already are. <laughs> the point of the of this video was to show that we are in charge of ourselves. Right. Imagine for a second if you put the restaurants in charge of your weight. Because since they're getting blamed from the bigger portions, should we put them in charge of your weight? Should the restaurants dictate what you're going to eat based on your weight? Right. And that's the point is change only comes through us, the yes. people. We're the ones that we can change any industry yes. by demanding better food, better quality food, and not buying the less quality food. Exactly. Exactly. A hundred percent. It's so true. You know? It's so and, true. And I know some of the audience, you know, and I know that because I get that question a lot, goes, they tell me, well, you know, good quality food is more expensive. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you one thing, one way you can actually eat better quality food 
but without spending a, a dime more. My clients, and I had one client actually who was a lawyer, and after he developed the first three habits, the you know eat less often, eat yeah. you know only when hungry, and stop eating when he says uh, eat slow and mindful, he, we're talking. He says to me, "Oh, coming to you, I'm making sixty dollars a week." I go, "How are you making money?" Because well, I'm paying you at that time it was one hundred forty dollars a week, and uh, uh, my food budget went down by two hundred dollars a week. I'm saving two hundred dollars <laughs> a week because of the new way that I'm eating. So I'm up sixty dollars. <laughs> oh interesting so then i did a survey to all my clients and you know what i came down to my what? average client after developing the first three habits saved 57 dollars. and by the way this was years ago so now it's probably even bigger the difference. yeah 57 dollars a week per person the food bill went down wow so we can take the 57 dollars a week and we can apply it towards buying better quality food so you could yes. eat Better food, but without spending a dime more. Right. A, it, you, you'd be surprised how much waste, um, how much money we're wasting on food that we don't have to waste. We can just simply save it and buy better quality food. So there is a way, I think, to eat healthier yes. without spending more money. Exactly. That's so true. That's so true. Now, if you wanted to take everything that we've learned today and you wanted to emphasize on some important takeaways, what would you tell people? My takeaway, what I would tell people is like, start with the basics. In other words, I know there's tons of uh, healthy habits out there. There's new ones coming out all the time. And I would uh, tell people, start with the basics. Learn how to eat first. Learn to identify true hunger. Eat slow and mindful. Okay. Start with the basics. And also exercise. Start with one or two exercises. Don't try to change all your bad habits at once. So like the, the key takeaway, actually, just to break it down is look at your life. Look at what, identify all your unhealthy habits and pick one. Mm -hmm. Pick the, un, the unhealthiest habit that you have and find a healthy habit to replace it with. That's right. it. Do that. Once you get used to it, pick another one. And that's how you slowly going to change. Don't try to change all your habits at once. And that is my main message is don't try to change all overnight. Do right. one habit at a time and you'll see slowly as you're changing, the process speeds up actually because as you get more fit and you start getting more into it, you'll find you'll be able to do even bigger and bigger changes. Right. And that would be my main message. Now, what services do you offer? Like what different types of services do you offer your clients? I offer uh, for online services. I offer uh, my online uh, personal training in, they can go to uh, the practical fitness coach.com. That's my main service, which is uh, uh, I work with people one-on-one. -on -one. It's like a 12 week uh, program. And during those 12 weeks, my main goal is to get people to develop four specific behaviors they become completely habitual. And I know for a fact that once you develop these four behaviors, you're going to lose all the weight that you want and greatly improve your health in the process. Right. So that's one of my main services that I offer. That's great. And then do you have a facility also? You said, because that's your online stuff? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, my life is also have a facility in Danbury, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, there, I actually have other trainers who work for me that can work one on one with you to show you uh, uh, how to develop the exercise habit. I offer some of the same stuff. If some people, prefer, if they live around Danbury, Connecticut, they like to come to my facility so I can work with you in person. Yes. Uh, but most of my clients, obviously, they can come here. Mm -hmm. So that's why we also offer the online uh, program. Yes. And then we have a third option, which is my, uh, I call it the Stubborn Method which mm -hmm. is a self-paced online program that people can do it on their own. Oh, and, nice. You know, you know, so this way they can just follow the system. It has uh, some of the seven modules, and then each module focuses on one behavior. Okay. And again, it's methodical. You work on one behavior, you adapt into your life, then you go to the next one. So, so that system, you only watch one video at a time. Each video mm -hmm. asks you to take certain actions, until right. you've taken those actions, you don't watch anything else. It's not one of those programs you gotta read the whole thing and right. then apply it. Exactly. Is one step at a time. Oh, and like that, that one is on uh, it's the Okay. And they can find that program. 
Oh, that's awesome. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much, Stavros, for coming on the show. And I oh, hope no, thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. I, I hope to see you soon. I'd love to, you know, talk more about weight loss and, and different healthy ways to go about weight loss. And uh, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Oh, okay. No, thank you. No, I'd love to come on the show again one day soon. <laughs> yes. Well, you have a great day. Thank you.